Hi, welcome to the Revolver Fan First podcast, where we go deep with artists on their history as a fan. I'm your host, Christina Rowett, and joining me today is the mighty Neil Fallon of Clutch. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So the first thing we do is kind of go back to the beginning and ask, who was the first artist you put on a pedestal? Ooh. Um, well, I mean, there's childhood pedestals. Mm-hmm. Um I remember uh, when I was very young, my parents signed up for one of those uh, kind of almost Ponzi scheme things called Columbia Clearinghouse, where you get like 20 records for 99 cents, and then you're obligated to buy a, rec- a couple records every you know month. This was back in the 70s. And I remember they would bought all sorts of weird records that they wouldn't have otherwise. One of them was uh, Blondie's Auto American. Awesome. And I was, I don't know seven at the time and i remember hearing rapture and just being terrified in in a way that i just wanted to listen to it over and over again because i i I didn't know what was going on um maybe i was a bit older i don't remember so that was that was a first pedestal i remember um and then uh later on when i got to my teenage years it was uh i think the bad brains were uh, a pedestal because they were somewhat local, both between DC and New York, and seemed somehow accessible in a way that they weren't uh, immaterial. Mm. And they were just still, in my books, one of the best bands out there that kind of defined a genre. And um, I, I still have a couple on pedestals, but sometimes it's best to keep them that way i mean it's it's true you can you can set up unrealistic expectations from pedestals you can ruin it yeah with the humanity of it all did you see them live much have you seen them live bad brains uh only a handful of times i saw them once uh in 1989 Mm -hmm. i was 17 and i think that that set the bar so high uh that's been hard to live up to that both with any other band or them i've seen them a number of times since uh but that was a co- well, the first time i remember thinking that going to a show was almost like an or even better than going to church it was when you walked out you felt invigorated and like this kind of afterglow of energy that you just wanted to bottle up and to have never end um then you wake up the next day with a sore neck and ringing ears and you want to do it again the next weekend well, hey, Charles, an interesting character, you know, in in terms of energetic, yeah. energetic, can, uh, like radiance. Do you feel how much of a responsibility does the front man have to control the energy? Do you think, or impact the energy in a room? I don't think it's so much control as it is to kind of <clears throat> channel, um, or just kind of act as a, a conductor. Uh, sometimes, the best way to channel energy for a front man is to shut up. Um, you don't have to talk in between every song. Sometimes you need to let silence, you know, do its job. Uh, sometimes, you know, you see these guys, you know, and heavy metal suffers from this a lot. Like the guitar player starts doing the solo and here comes the front man wandering over him and starts like doing this air guitar solo next to him. It's like, you know, just give the guy a break, man. Go get a drink of water on stage left. Um but I think it because it's a I think vocals and lyrics tend to have a much more emotional, immediate uh, impact. So people tend to look at the front man or woman or just want to say front person. Yeah, sorry. As, yeah, no, I should say that. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't matter. Just um, as almost like a like a, a very personal relationship because communicating with words is a little different than communicating with the hi hat or uh, a keyboard or what have you so they tend to get the the attention well and then there's also yeah yeah and i also you know it's also the historical reason because before amplification the person with the voice had to be in front to be heard and that's sort of a it's an archaic just holdover from vaudeville really (laughs) that's a fun fact well i guess it's the only language we all speak as well like people don't speak guitar you know yeah i mean it has a you people aren't saying wow that was that was a that g that g flat was a little sharp nailed it i mean so, maybe <laughs> maybe Ber- berkeley school of music guys do but yeah. 99.9% of us don't 
Yeah, I had um I had a moment at a clutch show where I was standing behind a couple of girls who were dancing and yelling every word and being really drunk and I had like this real moment of nostalgia for my best friend who'd moved away. There was something like there was everyone was very involved. I like everyone was very everyone's very involved at a clutch show. They're not they're not disconnected from the from the world. It's um it's a great thing to have engineered, really. Good on you. Well, thank you. It's yeah. um our fans are great and it's a uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we get kind of established ourselves by just playing live shows over and over and over again as opposed to like having the the feel good hit of 1998 you know it's um it takes longer to build up that fan base but the live music fan is much more involved by default they're they're not a passive listener they buy music, they plan, it's like they're going to take time off of work, they're going to go to the show, maybe get a hotel. It's a big deal. Uh, I think heavy metal and rock and roll <clears throat> uh, enjoy that kind of, I don't passion. And it may not be the biggest scene, but it's the best. Yeah, it is. It's the best people. It's the best people from end to end, really. There's something, I, it's difficult to be in this for the wrong reasons, because it's a lot of work. And uh yeah, I mean, not yeah. that oversimplifies it, but you know, who will? Okay, so I mean, you guys have been together for a long time, the same people. That's pretty rare. What? Who were you before you kind of found Clutch? Who were you at age fifteen musically? What were you hmm. wearing? Like, what? What was your whole? Because you joined Clutch when you were twenty, right? Let's see, um, ninety three, so twenty two, twenty two, uh, twenty one. Well, no. I mean, 91. So I was, yeah. yeah, I was 20. Yeah. I was thinking of our first record. Yeah. I was 20, um, actually 19 for a good part of it. Yeah. So, um, that was right after high school and I had known John Paul and Dan well before then. And we had like high school bands and different iterations that you would, the thing was you would break up basically. So you would have an excuse to rename your band and draw a new logo on your notebook and say what that were, I'm in a band. What were the names? Know? What were the names of your high school bands? Uh, we had one called Moral Minority. Okay. Um, which was a straight edge band with the most lax straight edge rules um, you could what imagine. Were, what were they? <laughs> None. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a new kind of straight edge. It's kind of round. It, yeah, it was, it, was, it was ironic. Yeah, it's got ragged um, edges, ragged edges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, then we had a thing called uh, National Security Agency briefly and then uh there was a very brief thing called mona lisa overdrive and i wasn't uh in the picture for a minute and tim and jp and dan started another band called glut trip and i filled in for a couple of days that their uh, singer couldn't do and then uh we named it clutch with the intention of changing it but then it was just like one of those projects you think you're going to get around to and then it's too late it's pretty good. So, like it's not it's not the most exciting good. story, but that's the that's the story. It's good, you know. It's a it's a good name. Like you can't really argue with it. What well, thanks. I mean, I didn't yeah. know else. I, it wasn't until like recently that I learned that clutch also means a a small purse. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know, you do a Google search, sometimes you get purses. It's just it's a, it's a slightly different take. I mean, you can, you know, look, the merch opportunities are endless. Steve, I you like know? the way you think. Yeah, this it's about time. Where is the clutch clutch? This is an outrage. I feel yeah, I feel I feel unseen. It's I very meta. There's a lot of yeah, anyway. We could go down a whole path. What um well, I mean 91's a kind of an interesting moment in musical time and you kind of weren't carried up I guess carried up in like a lot of like trends or you guys were your own aggressive yeah you guys were your own your own thing essentially like where did it, where did it spring from um as far as our our sound in particular yeah. i kind of look back i if you asked me then i couldn't tell you but in, in hindsight i realized there's there was kind of three things that were the main ingredients to what we are now and that was the dc hardcore scene and punk rock scene you know all the discord stuff all the bands that were on in that scene whose names I can't remember, but also the big ones who they they kind of came and went like Minor Threat, and Void, uh, 
Black Flag, they were done with by the time I was old enough to go to shows, but we saw Fugazi more times than I can count. Um, Beef Eater, I'll be a, so many Marginal Man, uh, Rites of Spring, uh, Shudder to Think, that scene. Then there was also a thing called the Maryland Dune scene, which also included Virginia, and that was bands like Pentagram and uh, a lot of bands that were signed to Hellhound, uh, Wretched, uh, Unorthodox. And then the third element was the DC go-go scene, which isn't really known too well outside of DC. Uh, it's a very localized uh, form of music, uh, very percussive, a huge swing. And if you grew up in DC, particularly in the 1980s, you heard it all the time. And every high school marching band learned the go-go beats. And John Paul was one of those kids in high school marching band that learned the go-go beats. And they're, they're still present in Clutch today. So, so that's, I think that those are the things that made us what we are. So that's why the dancing is so prevalent. I think so. I think it has to do with the swing. Yeah. Heavy metal, heavy metal is pretty absent of swing um, and shuffles. I mean, there are, I think you listen to, you can hear it in classic metal and classic rock. Yeah. Like Thin Lizzy has shuffles all over the place. Um, but swing um, is not, uh, not too common. I mean, metals are pretty straight music. Even in odd times, it's very mechanical. Yes. Uh, that that's all well and good, but it's hard. Uh, it's hard to 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 shake your derriere with that. Um, it's easier to shake your head. And I'd rather, yeah. I mean, I'd rather be a part of the former than the latter. It's just more fun. It's it's more fun. What what? what? So there was a whole go-go scene. What, what what do people wear in the go-go scene? Like what what kind of people are drawn to this? I'm curious. This is a weird subset of humanity I didn't know existed. Okay, well, uh, this like the very 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 condensed version of it is uh, there's a, there's a man by the name of Chuck Brown who's yep. his mont is also called the Godfather of the go-go, and he was a blues guitar player, then a rhythm guitar player, and um, then he kind of invented, he incorporated this Afro-Cuban beat, Sick. which is on congas and, and a lot of percussion and keyboards and go-go bands usually would have, you know, upwards of 12 people sometimes. And they would uh, play nonstop. And this is all um, entirely African-American in D.C. Um, sometimes you would see go-go bands later on in the late 80s play with punk rock bands. And that's kind of how we got introduced to that because there would be the punk rock matinee at 2 p.m. that would go to 6 p.m. Those bands would load out while the go-go bands were loading in for the eight o'clock show. And the go-go shows would go from like nine o'clock at night to six o'clock in the morning or, or three o'clock in the morning. And the music never stopped what? because they wanted to keep, keep people drinking and keep people in the room. Because a lot of the times those deals were like, okay, you get a cut of the bar. Or, or what have you. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons Go-Go never really got too far out of D.C. is Go-Go songs are long. They're at least six minutes. Sometimes they, they're 20 minutes of, of one side of a record. So radio programmers have, want no part of that. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how but, many um, little subsets there are in the world like this hyper-local. So did you go to these these Go-Go raves? No, I mean I've I saw um, in junkyard band uh, at the nine thirty club, which was you know the more punk rock metal club. Yeah, and I forget who they opened up with, open up for. Uh, I, we did do a show, Clutch did under a pseudonym called the Small Upsetters, where we, where we played with Rare Essence. Yeah, and I sang with Rare Essence a song called Overnight Scenario, which in the middle of it, I just had to tell myself this is happening. Yes. <laughs> because rare essence was a thing when I was in junior high. Yeah. When Go Go was huge. This is before hip hop became the dominant music in that town. No, um, and, but honest to goodness, you know, Go Go's back then in the 1980s, I mean, my parents wouldn't even let me out of the neighborhood, let alone go to downtown DC on a Saturday night. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it's, it's not, it was, there was a lot of, um, you know, I think John Paul did. Yeah. And just because he was that dead set on seeing it 
um, and experiencing it. Yeah. What? Well, what's your relationship with heavy metal then? Because that hasn't kind of played into it in your dis- in our in our discussion to date. We haven't really. Yeah. How does heavy metal figure into your musical world? And you know, you as a- John Paul, John Paul, and Tim are the metal guys in the band. Okay, you're not the metal guy. I I like some metal. I really. I mean, I do, but I'm not the guy no. um, who was wearing a Slayer T-shirt in ninth grade. Yeah, Tim was. <laughs> yeah, um, but it, you know, there's. I then also you know, I hear metal so much, like touring, doing festivals, that when I'm on my free time, I that's not what I'm. That's not my go-to. Yeah, what do you smash at home? Mm, um, let's see. Uh, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of weird kind of esoteric electronic music. Also, a lot of um, um, kind of Af- like psychedelic, like nineteen seventies African rock, Sam rock. Uh, I was listening to Fela Kuti earlier. Um, That's a good balance. Yeah, it's you know it's kind of all over the place. That's true. Um, try, I, you know, it's uh, I, today I haven't listened to a lot of music because it's kind of been a shit show, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know you know how those things go yeah well okay just to take a random right turn slaughter beach um got a new new song got a new album and stuff can you please explain the story of the slaughter beach video because i'm quite fascinated and um it's a yeah. quite time i, I want to know what well, okay well i want to know I, from you I, you know i want to know too okay <laughs> especially I'm since i the uh, the thing is, is I learned long ago that, you know, videos, well, they've never been our forte. And finally, we found someone with uh, Dave Brodsky and Ali was that, you know, trust their their concept. And, you know, if I wanted to make Sauter Beach the way I had it in my head, I would need a hundred million dollar budget. It's, it takes some real skill to manifest cool things in a very manageable real world way. Uh, I could say that I could say this and I'll try to keep it short. Slaughter beach is a real place. And my family and I vacation near there once a year Mm -hmm. and it's got a pretty strange history. Yeah. You know, that involves uh, all manner of ugliness and also the horseshoe crabs with their blue blood and, uh, very sordid colonial you know uh, violence that doesn't really take place in the video except for the blue blood and the horseshoe crabs which uh, he kind of the way he explained it to us because he never did a treatment we're like what is the video going to be about and he's kind of like trust me <laughs> and uh, it's great. It was supposed to be a it tried to be a sequel to uh uh the uh, red alert boss metal zone as if this ship that we were in has crashed and somehow these replicants that we are uh, become allies with this local species of crab priestess you because know. why not <laughs> <It's logical. laughs> and then we get onto the ship and we were thinking about doing a third one for the song skeletons on mars mm-hmm. But I think we've just plumb run out of time to do that. Yeah, it is. It's a bit uh, sorted. Colonial violence is something that um, I think will stick with me. That's um, how do you <laughs> visualize like sorted colonial violence? I, that's actually not a bad name for something. In fact, you, you come <laughs> out with this stuff. Um, well, I guess that's kind of a theme, like the world, like sorted colonial. That feels like a theme. You, I feel like you've talked about colonial violence in the past. Um. If I have, it's, it's you know, I, I'd never, I, 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 it's not so much like I'm trying to soapbox or pontificate or anything like that, mm. but you, the things that have occurred and it's not, you know, the United States and, you know, Western Europe don't have a monopoly on that. This is, this is part of the human condition. Um, <clears throat> but the particular pl- place that we live um there's a 
I think back to what that must have been like for everyone involved. And I don't imagine a lot of smiles in, in, an, in an entire lifetime. It, the misery and the pain and the fear uh, of, of each other, whether it be the, pe- the native population of fearing the colonials or the colonials fearing each other because they're dying. Yes. Um, and who's to blame? Oh, it's probably the weird one who we've got to tie up to a stake. And there's a, a lot of this history we'll never know. But mm-hmm. I think it's implied kind of laterally through a lot of things mm. in the United States with the kind of um, uh, paradoxes that we have. You're a living paradox. The United States. I mean, even the word the United States is a paradox. Yeah, it, it is. And it's uh, for, a, for a country that, you know, likes to pride itself on, you know, it's christian values and uh being kind of the city on the hill we we certainly have a wonderful way of showing all the ways not to do that pretty much yeah it's yeah. A, it's a strange year of our lord on um, the early 21st century and um the western did the western world i mean it's i i think it's a time for escapism that's required and i think um you're especially adept at craft crafting sort of lyrical stories and worlds where one may escape within when did you first kind of fall in love with the written word? Like, was this, you, were you a big reader or were you, and and also like lyrical stories within music, like ones that kind of stuck with you as a kid? Um, one of the, my, my parents were fairly conservative people and mm-hmm. still are. And, but one thing that my parents always said, and this was something that this was open policy, they would never say I couldn't read a book whether it be from a library or for the bookstore, you know, within reason, you know, if, if we're something, you know, yeah, pornographic, they would not say, no, we can't do that. But sci-fi horror. Um, and they pushed a lot of that, some stuff like history stuff that I didn't like at the time that I appreciate now. Uh, I remember probably the first book and I'm maybe 13. I read something wicked this way comes by Ray Bradbury. And I was the, the same age as the main character it was the same time of year and it was the first time I felt like I'm in this book sick and it was it it was different than watching a movie that you were sucked into for two hours uh it was much more immersive because you're you're generating all the imagery in your own head and uh I do think um as far as music goes it I mean, this isn't the direct answer to your question, but I do. It does at the same time period. Um, I I was allowed to read Conan novels, and my my mom and dad didn't know what was going on in these Conan novels. It was it was pretty raunchy. <laughs> um, it, I mean, I was so young. I st- and they insisted that there was be a babysitter, and I was reading this Conan novel, listening to a eight track, probably from Columbia Clearinghouse. Uh, of Vangelis. I don't know if you're familiar with Vangelis, but there he had an album called Heaven and Hell, which was supposed to be, you know, Heaven and Hell is very dramatic. And I was had that as the soundtrack listening, you know, reading the, uh, to that, reading the Conan novel, because it just accentuated the experience. And the babysitter came in and just looked at me and said, you are so weird. <laughs> And that was the last time I ever saw her. And that's when I realized that, you know, the music and the books is where I wanted to keep living. What was the first song you wrote? Wow. Um, I mean, I'm sure there were songs that were written on a banged up acoustic guitar um, that I don't remember. Um, With Clutch. Well, there was... the songs with uh i don't actually know i think i got the right lyrics for most of that uh the guitar player wrote a good deal of that Mm -hmm. with clutch there was um might have been wicker that's on our seven inch uh that the, the early stuff was kind of very dark almost for lack of a better phrase gothic in a way yeah, I liked. I was a big, huge fan of the Swans. 
I love the kind of heavy, religious, kind of vague, um, apocalyptic listening. stuff. Yeah. And I would, I wanted to emulate that. And that kind of, I kind of tapped out on that personally, because I don't really think, to be honest with myself, that's not the kind of person I am. But at that age, you're still figuring stuff out. You're trying to still figure out who you are. Totally. Who are you now then? Have you worked it out? Oh, no, but I wouldn't, I think so. maybe you never would want to. Yeah. I'm not I saying you shouldn't have convictions and yeah. Um, it's, uh, I'm always, I'm always thinking like convictions and ideals can be like the hallmark of a lazy mind. You can, <laughs> it, <laughs> too consistent. No, it should be an ever evolving tide, just moving. I, I, I kind of think so. I mean, I'm not saying you should go try it, be intentionally hypocritical. But one thing that music has taught me is to be a good listener. Yeah. Uh, that's half the battle is shutting your mouth and listen and opening your ears because music is a conversation. And if you apply that to even things outside of music, you're going to learn stuff and that's going to change who you are. Yeah. Hopefully. You'd hope you'd hope that, that, that there's a bit of input going on, that it's not just output. Um what did you ever sing into a hairbrush as a as a young person? Have did you did you ever have what were your how did you okay, we've gotten to like lyric like music and words, but when did you kind of you know, because you've got quite an iconic voice and stuff, how did you find that that would be an avenue to pursue? It took me a long time. It was like 10 years into doing clutch. You I serious? Mean, I, yeah. I never, I mean, I think my aspirations of being a singer in a rock band was just as fleeting as most people. Like, oh, there's no way. That's just impractical. And it was honestly hammered into my head that that's not, that's not a viable career choice. Um, and when you're, when you get that hammered into your head, if you can eventually start believing that. And I, for many years thought, that, okay, clutch is something I will do. And then I get to do the real thing, which is be miserable. Um, which is, I, it's a shitty attitude. It, it was. Cultivate it, misery it, like it, a long fingernail. People love yeah. cultivating misery like a long fingernail. <laughs> but, but Tim and Dan, I mean, Tim and JP were the kids that were like, oh, I'm going to be in a rock band. No, there's, there's there's no conversation. I'm going to be in a rock band. So thankfully, they kind of pulled me by my my collar along the way. And it was kind of like early 2000s when I realized, oh, well, I've been doing this almost 10 years. Uh, maybe this is what I do. And once I did that, it became one a lot more fun. Uh, and I think I got better at it at that point because I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to be better at it instead of just like winging it yeah and uh you know it's uh and, and now i'm incredibly grateful because there's not a lot of folks get to do something this fun for a living uh making a living in the creative arts which i knew i was going to do or want that's what i wanted to do i just didn't know which one yeah uh, to be able to do that is it's a rare thing and totally. i'm so happy to do it i mean i get to write lyrics and people I've never met sing them back in my face years later it's cool it's it's pretty epic dude like that that is actually the best part of um this podcast is just kind of weird. just seeing all these people just doing what they wanted to do it's not um it's not boulevard of broke broken dreams it's actually like unbroken dreams this is it, you have an unbroken yeah, dream that's pretty sick it, it's it's incredibly fortunate it's a mixture of a lot of hard work hmm. but it's also it's also luck. I mean, I know tons of either bands that just never could get out of the garage or if they did, maybe things were going great and then tragedy happened. Yeah. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, so when you look back and say, we've been in a band for 30 years and now there's more people coming to our shows than ever before. It's sort of like the, it's like the rock and roll Dorian Gray. It's backwards, but uh, it's fine with me. Well, it's the cons it's the consistency as well. Like you know, you don't disappoint people who love clutch. Oh, thank like, you. But it's true. Like it's just it's it's. I think it's quite inarguable. It's like people if they like you, they like like who 
Who's dis- people aren't disappointed by clutch. Like you just, they're just not. It's just not a thing. Well, it's you know, I'm sure there, I'm, someone I'm is. Sure there are, and that's fine. You I know, I, I, th- I think it's it's better to to appeal to the to the right people as opposed to the most people. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, McDonald's sells the most hamburgers. Are they the best hamburgers? No. No, f- those people are it's, weird. Yeah, it's uh, I'm you know the I think it's um, it's a good spot to be in. Yeah, and we put out our own records on our own label, which allows us to sell the right amount to the right people instead of saying, okay, we're going to hope that this is the breakthrough album and, you know, they're going to be a household name next year and just you wait and see. Nah, it's not about that. Well, they should call record deals um, loans. Well, that's are. what they are. Because they are. <laughs> like, the whole thing's a bit absurd as a premise. Like, you know, it's so it's, well, how did you find those people? How would you define a clutch fan? What do you think they share? I think well, I think they share a um, a love of a good night out. Yeah, dude. Uh, I think they love sincerity. I have seen um, bands open up for us uh, that are a lot like us, but they came across kind of insincere, phoning it in, and the, the clutch crowd wanted nothing to do with it. And I've seen bands that are nothing like us, that are incredibly sincere, and the and the crowd loved it. That's interesting. I mean, for for example, um, there's a, a French band called uh, the Inspector Clouseau that we've done a bunch of shows with, and they're two French guys. Um, well, they would say they're from Gascony, but they're farmers and they're a duo, and they're incre- they're very very French, and they make it a, a point. So when they came to the United States, and I was looking at like, okay, we're How's this going to go over in Lubbock, Texas, or you know Springfield, Missouri, which can be you know pretty conservative, and people ate it up. It, they they were, it was an explosive reaction just because it was so sincere, and they put it all out on the stage, which is another part of it. It's yeah, I think uh, if they see you're sweating, because I think a lot of Clutch fans sweat all day too. We're you know it's a uh, it's a working crowd. <laughs> it's a working crowd, yeah. People yeah. showed up to work, man. This is, a, yeah. this, is not spe- this is not a spectator sport. A clutch no, show is not, not a spectator sport. No. Mm-mm. No. That's that's solid. Well, what did you what's some like sincerity on the new album? Where what what would you say is the most sincerest place on the new album? Or do you think sincere is merely a reflection in a live environment? Hmm. I mean, music is subjective. So, I mean, it's like, uh, I will say this about the new record. Like when we first started, I had in my head, like I I wanted this to be like the most upbeat uh, party album, you know, because I I did not want the last two years to poison the well. You know, I didn't want any of this kind of like melancholy or any of this horse shit. Um, and we did a couple of real upbeat songs and they were great. But then slowly as we wrote more and more, it became more of a, a dark record. And I think that's because instead of trying to premeditate it, I was just writing from the heart. And, you know, and it really doesn't have anything much to do about the two years. But I think there's a there is a um, not to get too too fancy, but there's a zeitgeist that infects everything that you you try as you may you, you're get you're part of it too so i mean there's some i think a song like um mercy brown is sincere in that it's a lot different than any clutch song that we've ever done uh kind of like the regulator where when we did that i had no idea how clutch fans were going to react and now we see how everyone reacted i'm not saying that that's why mercy brown was written but it's that different and i think it's sincere to take a chance yeah than to try to redo a an idea that you already knew worked yeah well it's the zeitgeist thing's interesting 
Um, I feel like there was a big shift in humanity. I mean, just there's nothing like forced loss to um really see what's there behind mm-hmm. it. Take away people's distractions, make people sit in their feelings. I mean, that's going to shift consciousness on some level. You know, for sure. You know, know, and it also brings out the best and worst. Yeah. You know, I've seen it. I saw a lot of true colors, you know, for better or worse. And some of it really surprised me, you know, and like people that I didn't think would rise to the occasion. Like, wow, you're not who I thought you were or vice versa. Like in your personal Uh, life or at a a bigger level, at a macro level? uh, Both. Yeah. Both. I mean, I think our person. Our personal lives are just kind of microcosms of everything else. I mean, uh, you could take away the you know, the languages and circumstances. Human behavior is pretty universal. We're just animals, really. Just weird. Oh, yeah. Weird little animals trying to get We're by. We're not even very good at that either. No, I mean, all we got is telling stories. But, like, who are we to say that m- monkeys aren't telling stories that we just can't understand them? Like maybe mm. birds are telling their own stories. Or this whole human idea that the art is what makes us different may actually be complete bullshit. Yeah, especially if you consider like sensory perception, like what a, yeah. um, you know, like when I walk my when I walk my dog and she just like really really needs to smell that one bush. It's like I know she's getting information in a way that's like probably like tripping on acid. This is true, and I'm. And not for nothing, I'm kind of jealous. I could just walk around and, you know, smell the dirt and get information. Yeah. But have you ever had a very re- revelatory acid trip? No. No. <laughs> it's no. really just stupid. Yeah. No. no. What? Okay. Let's go. Let's get random. Um, given the choice of anyone in the world, who would you want as a dinner guest? As a dinner guest. Yeah living yeah no you can have like i'm um, i'm leaving it open like this is ridiculousness so yeah um wow that's a that's a tough one it uh, is Chang- i would like to have, i would have nikola tesla as a dinner guest he's a pretty interesting cat i mean yeah electricity how about it yeah i, I it just there's so much like like uh, apocryphal stuff written about him. I would just like to get the the, the right or you know, hear it from the horse's mouth. I mean, of course, you there's all the usual suspects like Jesus and um, those guys, Socrates and Plato or what have you. But I think in the in a tangible way, like if he if he had uh, won the electricity war, what kind of world would we be living in? It, I would imagine it would be significantly different. Yeah, it's 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 a tangible way to sit to play what if as yeah. opposed to like something from It'd millennia ago. This is true. What album was the first artist you had a strong reaction to that wasn't love? That was like negative. What what kind of music did you just? Uh, <sighs> oh, that, that's a, my my sister's love of Broadway show tunes. <laughs> you know, sorry, any, any of them. Cats, uh, Miss Saigon, Annie, um, and and for she she would sing along with them. And I don't really like that kind of stuff. But I my wife took me to see, and this was quite some time ago, see uh, Man of La Mancha in on Broadway. I didn't want to go, and I went to go see, it and I was actually blown away. And it wasn't so much the music, but watching like professional stagecraft with changes of sets. And how all the working parts moved, it would. I became a fan, but you know, Broadway tunes. Oh man, that's tough. It's not. Yeah, oh, dialogue, dial, sung dialogue. No, thank you. You're never going to do a rock opera, a clutch rock opera. <laughs> not if I can help it. If you had no limitations and stuff, what would like that you could do something with the clutch universe? What? What would you do, like in terms of an immersive experience, or like that? That has um, so that has very little parameters there as a question, but you know, I'm just putting it out there. I would love, to, I would love to write a soundtrack. Yeah, I, mean, I don't, I would, don't think we would want to write the script, um, or act in it. But I think writing a soundtrack would be fun. I've once or twice 
been in a studio that had a larger studio next to it where a composer was conducting a chamber orchestra Sick. watching the movie with time code and I, I would never do that because I don't have the skill set, but I just think it would be a real cool thing to write that and then to see it on screen. Yeah. What director would you work with? Who do you think would on be a good fit for you? Ooh. Oh, man. Um, I want to see this happen. Well, I mean, I'm a huge Stanley Kubrick fan, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, recently. Uh, oh, who... Who did um and um, he's a gr Greek um director did Mandy. Um, I'm blanking, I dude. Forget, yeah, I forget his name, but when he opened up Mandy with King Crimson and the 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 panning over the trees, I was immediately sold. It's like I love this movie. I can walk out now. Um, but uh, Sick. I'm really horror. I'm not a big movie guy, so yeah. I'm probably you're a horror guy. Then that's just like movies in general. I, I, I don't watch too many of them. Keep it pretty uh, safe. Fair play. Okay. I like, uh, yeah. I like some, some of them, not, but not a ton of them. That's fair play. Do you, what, who would be your musical Mount Rushmore if you had four faces carved in the stone? And what um would these like forefathers or foremothers teach you? What did they teach you? Mm. Um, oh, first one that comes to mind is Willie Dixon. Yeah. Because he wrote so many songs uh, that we all know that we don't know Willie Dixon wrote. Like what? Oh, geez. Uh, let me get a list. I mean, there's tons of uh, Led Zeppelin songs that. Uh, see, if you're going to ask me stuff like this now, I need to go like. You need to go, go look on. Go look. <laughs> um, uh, Willie Dixon. Um, Big Mama Thornton. Yeah. And let's see, uh, as far as man, Eddie Hazel from Funkadelic and uh, who else? Uh, well, Funkadelic's an interactive stage show. George Clinton, that, you know, that, yeah. that, that's a hard working crowd. Eddie Hazel is at probably one of the most underappreciated guitar players, I think. Uh, yeah. I mean, I could say, oh, let's put Ian Gillen and uh, Jimi Hendrix. I'm trying to think of fo folks that maybe uh, aren't as acknowledged. And um, Buddy Miles. Uh, who else? I mean, those are the first. I'm trying to think of a vocalist, but Buddy Miles was a great vocalist. Um uh so these are all prototypes these are all people who started things yeah i mean nowadays people that are around like i'm a big, huge nick cave fan um um australian i love kate yeah australia, kate bush our contribution yeah kate bush good on her for like having this ridiculous late surgeons on a tune she wrote in the 80s it's sick yeah I love she it. was one of those, like my juvenile crushes yeah that's Still kind of linger to this. That Kate Bush in a suit of armor all day long, please. <laughs> she's a yeah. she's a badass motherfucker, really. Like yeah, she know. was. You know, it's she was. Yeah. She stood her own in in a in a, an environment that didn't make it easy to do that, and still is that way. It's a strange uh, world you exist in, really. Music. Yeah, it's it's uh. I mean, I. I don't know um, what it was like back then because I, I wasn't there then. Yep. Uh, it's a, uh, I have a feeling it's probably, I think it's a, it's an emotional place because I think artists are emotional people. So things get even more writ large. Yeah. Um, and also when you're on tour or in a studio, they can be pressure cookers and, uh, people behave in strange ways yes what's the strangest behavior you've witnessed in your uh, 30 years on the clock oh wow well, i mean you will have seen some strange behavior like let's be real 
Yeah, I, it's hard to say. I we get asked that question a lot, and it's I I draw a blank because yeah. I think I've seen so much of it that I have a tolerance to um to seeing it. I mean, <laughs> it's awesome. I've had thirty years of it. Yeah, I mean, what are you gonna do? I mean, I've. I've Oh man, I, I I can't think of anything that really stands out. Yeah, there's usually something bizarre every damn day on tour. Yeah, the, it's a strange world you inhabit. You know, a beautiful place though. It's fun. Yeah. You know, what every, else have you been doing? I I I, I shudder to think. You yeah, know. this is a this is a good path. Well, what um, have you ever been starstruck? Um, not really. I mean, I, I was, I've been taken aback. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember we were, it was the last show of our tour with Motorhead in the UK at the Hammerstein. And I was walking down the hallway and I just saw, uh, well, let me back up during the show. I looked up at what's the VIP booth which is actually behind glass and it's backlit. So all you can see are silhouettes of people. And you can see the crowd in front of you with they got lights on, but these are just shadows. And I saw like these people one after the other, but right in the middle, there was this one person who was the head at least a foot taller than everybody else with hair, like just a ton of hair. It looked like a stalk of broccoli. And I knew instantly it was Brian May <laughs> just by his silhouette. And then about an hour later, I walked down the hallway and sure as shit, there he was talking to Dan. And I was like, wait, how does this happen? You know, the, the, cause I grew up listening to that on the radio and he yeah. was usually the rocks, like the real honest to God rock stars are the most down to earth people you can imagine. This is true. Whereas the people that want to be rock stars or think they are, are such a pain in the ass. One hundred percent. And it's cool. Um, I did some stuff with um Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden and Deep Purple. I went and filmed a charity single they did. And there's something quite joyous about these people who've spent, and you would relate, like spent decades doing this. That they almost seem like they've gone back to being the twenty year old souls when they get together. There's something kind of mm. timeless and like this never grow up. You kind of didn't have to grow up. And I guess that's just not having to stop dreaming. I think sometimes that's what makes people get old. Yeah, it it does. And I think that's one of the great things. If you have the creative impulse, you always want to find out what's around the next corner. Yeah. you know, And people like Ozzy, he doesn't have to tour. <laughs> no. He hasn't had to tour in decades, but he, he likes it. It's fun. And it's yeah. sort of like a shark. He, he has to keep moving forward. I mean, I'm sure, you know, as they say, idle hands make are the devil's workshop. That's but true. there are tons of artists like that. Um, Bruce Springsteen. Maybe William, Willie Nelson asked you to pay off his back taxes, but I think I, I hazard a guess he just genuinely likes it. Yeah, it's you're a good bunch. Well, what um where did you go lyrically that you haven't gone to before in the new album? What's like some little um lyrical places you've gone that you haven't kind of danced around before? Um, let's see the, um, well, again, Mercy Brown is yep. kind of much more of a, a ballad in some ways. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a, a song about a vampire or someone who was accused of being a vampire, which is not something that is usually in the clutches universe no. usually it's it's aliens you know which we have those on the album too so aliens um, is your milieu say again say aliens are your milieu do you believe in you yeah you believe in aliens. So I, um i mean yeah. it, as the way that they're depicted on hollywood no not really but i think it would i think it's incredibly arrogant to look out this in the night sky and think we're the only ones especially with what we see from like the james webb telescope to see every one of those galaxies with millions of galaxies with millions of stars with millions of planets, you know. There's a bit I too mean, much infinite. And yeah, there's a bit too much infinite. This, 
this is as good as it gets. It cannot. It cannot be I that. I mean, no. I I demand better. <laughs> what a world, man. What a world. Like, you know, it's it's um okay, what's your most treasured memory? We're just going esoteric here. Um uh, treasure uh, the birth of my son. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't get any more humbling than that. It doesn't get any more emotional than that. Um you know, for many years, I thought that was going to be the death knell of my creative life because now you're a dad and you're just going to mow the lawn and grill meat and be bar and be awful. Um, but given the the opportunity to explain the world to someone is the most stimulating creative exercise there is, you know. You're wow. so used to just looking at stuff and saying, yeah, I know what this is, but they're asking questions. Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? And sure, sometimes you just make shit up and you lie, but it also makes yourself ask, yeah, why? I haven't actually thought of that in 48 years. And it, it's it been, it put a lot of wind in my sails. And, like uh, creatively and as a person and as a Yeah. Person. Yeah. Dude, I've never it's, heard parenting explained as explaining the world to someone. That's a that's a really interesting way of putting it. Yeah. I look at I look at that way. I mean, and a lot of it's, you know, biological, you know, instinct kicks in. It's not as daunting as it can be. You know, I'm sure there are plenty of single mothers out there who would love to disagree with that and they'd be right. But my particular experience has been amazing. Yeah. Sick. You made your own people. Well, my wife did really. Yeah, well, technically, I mean, look, you played a role. <laughs> look, you didn't, you know, you weren't, you didn't have no role in it. You yeah. know, it's an interesting. I was role. a background background actor. Yeah, background player, but that's it's an important one. You know, the, the show doesn't go on without it. But um, well, thank you for um, for making so many things, so many other things, and putting them into the world. That's a that's a beautiful thing. I have one well, final question for you, which is five songs that changed your life. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, we'll start very early on. Uh, there was a band from California in the late 60s called West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band. Mm -hmm. Kind of an, an acid rock band. Uh, my dad's friend lent him a record, and I remember listening to it at a very early age. I'm talking three, four on headphones and being terrified. Because uh, this was very, you know, experimenting with stereo panning and early effects. And I think that kind of set a blueprint where I really, like, realized that music could be really weird and and scary. And that was kind of fun. Um, there's that song. Did you want to do um, that later? Make music that was scary and, like, ex experimental with that stuff? Yeah. I mean, I never ever had the impulse to say oh i want to write a song that the whole world's going to sing yeah i would rather create a world that i thought was kind of interesting and if other people liked it too they were more than welcome to join me yeah sick good but, idea. um other songs uh probably banned in dc by uh bad brains that they open with that show i was talking about a little bit ago that was the song they opened up with in dc at the 9 30 club and my my spinal cord hasn't been the same since <laughs> so uh what else um i think the first time i the first time i heard black sabbath was and i, I wrote a song about the lyrics about that um called a good fire and uh that's on book of bad decisions and it was i remember was at a, bo a bonfire in october with you know some of the the less academically inclined kids you know the kids the the ninth graders who smoked <laughs> you know that that crowd like those kids. <laughs> yeah and i was very intrigued by that and i remember them putting on black sabbath black sabbath i had never heard it before and it scared the shit out of me this is a recurring uh, theme yeah, and likewise, there's Bonnie, another one. Scared of Blondie, uh, scared of Sabbath. Uh, this, this, yeah. NW, NWA, straight out of Compton. When Amazing. I heard that, scared the shit out of me. I wanted to hear it again, and because no one heard anything like that before. 
It was it was threatening. It was catchy as shit. Um, so that was a one of those early hip hop records, and also Public Enemy. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. And probably the first time I also heard um, uh, Tom, uh, Tom Waits' Bone Machine. That's when I realized that you could also get real nuanced storytelling through the power of lyrics with you don't need a whole lot of bells and whistles, just the right words. Yeah. What's, um, what's a song you wish you wrote? Uh well, on that that record immediately comes to mind that the song "Going Out West" has some of the best lines I've ever heard. It's one of those things. Yeah. Wait, okay, which one? Okay, let's let's get a detail. Like, what's a, what's a good line? Oh, what's a good line off that? We'll we'll close it out. I know, okay, I know karate, voodoo yeah. too. I'm gonna make myself available to you. I don't need no makeup. I got real scars. I got hair on my chest. I look good without a shirt. <laughs> That's solid, man. And That's it's in the, the 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 genius of it is it that it doesn't rhyme. It, it doesn't need to rhyme. Yeah. Does it? yeah. So he's I look good without a shirt. It's like it, he's he's so confident. He doesn't need to rhyme it. No, it's beautiful. <laughs> Note. I think that's a great way to end the show, to be honest. Let, okay. let's, let's appreciate the majesty of Tom Waits. Yes, let's. That's a beautiful thing. Well, you have an excellent day. You yeah. too. You and enjoy Bye. the future. Yeah, I will. You too. Okay. Thanks everyone for watching. It's a real old fan first podcast.